All right, uh, let's get started. So I'm going to try to talk about three things today, and I'm going to try to keep it to 10 minutes, so that means really not too much time for each one. Um, but I'll go fast and then, I guess, just interrupt if you have any questions. So the three things I'm going to talk about today, number one, asynchronous execution, number two, parallel execution, and number three, making state access more performant, um, aka MonadDB. So first of all, asynchronous execution. So just for context, with most blockchains, consensus and execution are interleaved, and specifically execution is a prerequisite to consensus because um, you know we typically have a leader-based approach. The leader executes a list of transactions, produces the Merkle root of the state tree, posts those transactions, and then sends out a block proposal that has all those transactions plus the Merkle root, and then everyone else receives that, re-executes, make sure that it matches, and then votes. So basically, you know, it's a highly interleaved process. And the problem here is that it actually means that the budget for execution is very limited. Like it's a very small fraction of the block time because realistically consensus is expensive. Consensus is nodes that are, you know, potentially on opposite sides of the world communicating. So because consensus is expensive, it takes up most of the block time. So there's this shrinking effect where the actual budget for execution is only a very small portion. So in Ethereum, we have 12 second blocks, um, but the rough budget for execution is about 100 milliseconds, which is only 1%, which is crazy small. So for me, it reminds me of the thing that people tell you, which is, um, and I, I think this is just a, a common saying that's probably wrong, but like you only use 10% of your brain. So like, what if you could take the limitless pill and use 100% of your brain? Like, how smart would you be? So that's kind of the goal with asynchronous execution. So the idea is super simple. So we have consensus is kind of the black components here, and execution is the, um, the, the pearl components. So instead of interleaving these and having execution be a prerequisite consensus, we'll just do consensus. It's a really like stupidly simple idea. Just do consensus, so just have agreement about the official ordering of transactions, have everyone come to agreement about that. And then once that happens, then you know, in parallel, execute that list of transactions that we've just consensus on while in parallel doing consensus on the next block, which you kind of see here. So it's like we do uh, consensus on block one and then start doing consensus on block two while doing execution on block one. Um, so it's a simple idea, but then, of course, the question is like, um, oop, just peeking. Um, so the, the question is like, uh, how do we make that work? Or why don't people do this right now? And so I guess a couple of things, you know, in the 10 minutes, there's probably not time to get into all of it. Um, you can ask questions if you want, but I think a couple of things to point out. So all the nodes are agreeing on the official ordering of transactions. That means that if they start from the same state and they agree to do the same work, they should continue to be in the same state. So it's actually, you know, when nodes come to agreement about the official ordering, the actual state is finalized. Like everything is deterministic. Um, so the things we have to worry about are, you know, if one node has a computational error, like it gets hit by cosmic rays or something, how do we defend against that? that corner case, and then also spam prevention. So like, how do we make sure that, because consensus basically is nodes coming to agreement, but with a delayed view of the execution state, how do we make sure that there isn't an account that has spent all of its gas, but then is submitting a bunch of transactions that we mistakenly include in consensus? And so just to summarize the solution there, um, you know, we introduced a concept called a reserve balance, where there's a very small portion of gas um, that's set aside that's used to pay for inclusion and consensus. That's number one, that addresses the spam problem. And then number two, to address the possibility of um, computational errors, there's a delayed Merkle root that's included in the consensus blocks. So if one of the nodes, you know, has a disagreement on that delayed Merkle root, then they'll go and re-execute that you know, delay period of blocks. Um, so I'll just move on from here right now because we have to keep moving. But just in general, like 
that this is an important concept with respect to execution and monad, that we move execution out of the hot path into a separate uh, swim lane. Okay, so number two, parallel execution. So I want everyone to think of execution as being just like a black box that gets to the end state after executing a list of transactions that are defined in a linear order. But instead of just you know, doing them serially, which would be um, dumb, but is also how Ethereum and other blockchains work right now, we should strategically try to do work in parallel. And I'll talk about what it means when I say strategically. So just to emphasize, the job of execution is to get to that end state as if we just run these transactions one after another. So how do we do that? Um, it's actually a really simple algorithm. People have very fancy names on it, and they try to make it seem really complicated. But it's actually really simple. So the idea is just we're going to run a bunch of transactions in parallel, assuming that they're starting from the same point. Um, and then we're going to generate a bunch of pending results. And a pending result basically keeps track of the inputs and outputs for that transaction. So that's the first step. And then the second step is we're going to go through those pending results one by one and commit them, or try to commit them, actually. And if we see one of the inputs has been invalidated, then we're just going to go re-execute. So I'll do a really simple example. Um, so say transaction one, I, I, prior to transaction one, I have 1,000 USDC in my, in my account's balance. So that particular slot has 1,000 in it. And then I send, in transaction one, I send five USDC to Canal. Um, okay, and then in transaction two, that's say that's some unrelated transaction, like someone else is minting an NFT, totally unrelated. Transaction three, I send 10 USDC to Danny. Okay, so parallel execution just means we do all these three in parallel. So transaction one would have that slot as an input of 1,000 and an output of 995. Um, and then ignore transaction two. Transaction three would start with an input of 1,000 and end with an output of 990. Okay, so then we have these now these pending results, and then we step through and we commit them. So we can commit transaction one, um, which had an input of 1,000 and an output of 995 without any issue. Um, we can commit transaction two without any issues. And then when we get to pending result three, um, this one actually has an input of 1,000. So we can't commit this one because uh, we're keeping track of the running state, and the running state for this slot is now 995. So then we just go re-execute this one. So it's a really simple, intuitive algorithm. Um, and then the only thing I want to point out also, so everyone always asks me, like, OK, great, but what if all the transactions are all related to each other? So you have to keep re-executing all the transactions. So the good news is that the parallel execution part, like the first stage of executing all these transactions in parallel, has a result of surfacing dependencies and pulling them into cash. So you know, all these dependencies, they live on SSD. Um, and SSDs are great. They're really, um, they've gotten a lot better in recent years, but they're really high throughput. And they're pretty fast. But to do one of these lookups um, is about 40 to 100 microseconds. So you know, whereas when that data is in cache, that's less than a microsecond to look up. So this first step of running all these transactions in parallel to generate all these pending results, um, that has the effect of surfacing dependencies and pulling them all into cache. And that can be done in parallel. And then the second phase where we're stepping through these transactions one by one and com either committing them immediately or re-executing, the re-execution is fast because now almost all the time these slots are in cache. Um, every now and then there's like a you know, code path change because the inputs have changed a little bit. Um, and so sometimes you still have to go back to, cat, to um, SSD, but almost all the time they're in cache. So I guess lastly, I want to talk about the third ingredient here, which is efficient state access, or what we call MonadDB. So going back to the parallel execution problem, I think the thing that I emphasized was that we're running a bunch of transactions in parallel. Each one of them is surfacing dependencies, pulling them from SSD. So um, when we implemented our parallel execution algorithm at Monad, we realized pretty quickly that the actual bottleneck is the state access. And we have a whole bunch of different account slot tuples that are needing to read stuff off of SSD. 
And by default, Ethereum's software is storing all of these inside of another um, database called LevelDB. Um, in the case of Ethereum, or in the case of Solana, it's RocksDB. Um, but basically, everyone, all these existing clients are using commodity databases to store um, all of these account values and all these state values. And there are a couple of problems here. The first one is that data in Ethereum lives in a Merkle tree. So there's this data structure, a Merkle tree, but then that's being embedded inside of another data structure um, under the scene uh, or uh, behind the scenes, which in the case of LevelDB is an LSM tree. Um, in the case of several other um, databases, it's a B tree. But in any event, when you need to go look up a value from the Merkle tree, you're actually kind of doing like a quadratic lookup because you have to navigate all the way down to a node in the Merkle tree. But each visiting each node in that path also triggers a traversal into another tree that's under the uh, under the hood. So there's just you know it's just really inefficient to like look up all these values um, from the SSD. And then in addition, these databases also don't support asynchronous I/O. So um, when we're trying to do all these transactions in parallel, um, they block each other. So basically going through a single pipe in order to go look up these values. So what the solution was, we built a custom database for storing Merkle tree data called MonadDB. Um, it's using async I.O., specifically I.O. U-Ring. It has a bunch of other optimizations, like bypassing the file system. So basically, it's just a really efficient storage for Merkle tree data so that when we do this parallel execution, we're running all these transactions in parallel, we're able to pull the state dependencies from disk really fast. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you.